Welcome everyone to the functional conf, uh, the session Functional Ruby by Keith Bennett. Without any further delay, over to you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Keith Bennett, and let's talk about Functional Ruby. Um, I am from the US, but I live mostly in Southeast Asia. I guess we're talking about me now. Uh, I live mostly in Southeast Asia, mostly in Thailand and the Philippines. I'm a software engineer, primarily with Ruby, but with a lot of experience in C++ and C and Java in the past. Uh, currently, I'm studying AI because I want to move into that space. I'm a big fan of functional programming. Um, I've only briefly studied Clojure and Erlang, so I'm not at all an expert in functional programming, but I really liked what I saw when I did study those languages, and I tried to bring them back into my Ruby development work. And I'm open to work, and this is my website in case you want to find out more about me. Ruby is an object-oriented language, but it does have inspiration from functional programming. The language is created by Yukihiro Matsumoto, also known as MAT, and the language was first released in 1995. It has influences from Lisp, Perl, Smalltalk, Eiffel, and Ada. Mats created the Ruby language out of pain from working with other languages and not enjoying it. He thought, you know, why can't I enjoy my programming? And so he had studied many languages and he tried to pull together what he liked from, from many of the, uh, those languages. And he created Ruby. Uh, for him to enjoy his work and for others. And it's been wonderful for me. I, I love the language. The main Ruby implementations are CRuby and JRuby. CRuby is the reference implementation and it, it runs on top of C language. Um, there's a little bit of rust in, in some of the infrastructure. Um, it's the most widely used implementation by far, probably at least 95%. Um, the new features will go here first because this is the implementation that Mots deals with. And like Python, Ruby, CRuby has a global interpreter lock uh, such that only one CPU can be used for the, the running program. J JRuby, uh, on the other hand, um, can make use of um, all the CPUs in the system because it's using Java threads and the JVM uses all the CPUs. Uh, we have an access to wealth of Java libraries. And of course, this is all true for the other JVM languages like Scala and Clojure and Kotlin. Um, we can use a mature and stable JVM. And um, Lisp um, influenced Ruby a lot. And uh, here are some ways in which it did that. Closures. Ruby has code blocks, procs, and lambdas. And those are closures that are not associated with objects. They're not object-oriented methods. It has a built-in enumerable functionality, uh, which is really rich. Um, it has these basic ones, but many, many more. Ruby has symbols like Lisp, and it has REPLs. IRB comes with the Ruby distribution, and Pry is a third-party library. Here we can see how we might uh, double an array in Ruby. We have an array here, and then we call its map method. And then we pass it the code block, which is the code that will be used to transform the array into the new values. And then it returns a new array with the new values. It's similar in structure to Lisp and Clojure, but the order is different. I mentioned code blocks. Code blocks uh, were very new to me when I started with Ruby. And code blocks are code literals. This is It's like a function, but it's not named. And it's, not, it's, it's a code literal that is being passed to a method. So here's what's happening here. We have the object three. In Ruby, everything is an object, even numbers, even nil. So we have the object integer three, and we call its times method, and we pass it this code block. And this code block takes a single argument, which we will call i in the body of the code block. So that's what's happening, and this is what's produced. Now, the implementation of the times method, let's see what that might look like. This is not the exact implementation, but it could look like this. We have the integer class, we define the times method. The first line is used in case a block is not passed. And in that case, the method will create an enumerable object and return that object. And that is a kind of a value dispenser that can be used later. Uh, and that is a first class object. Um, assuming, whoops, I don't know why that happened. Um, so assuming we do pass a block, this line will be passed over and we will do this. And this is really the, the, the meat of the, uh, the iteration. We have a, a range, zero, 
up to, but not including self, three dots is exclusive of upper bound, two dots would be inclusive. So we have this range and for each value in that range, we yield to the given block and pass that block N as its parameter. And finally, we return self. So we're returning the, the object on which it was called, the three. Um, and so this method is just completely for side effects. It's not transforming a value and returning a different one or anything. Um, we saw the curly braces there, uh, but do end can be used as a synonym for curly braces. They're interchangeable, but uh, the style, uh, the prevalent style is that you would use the curly braces for a one-liner and the do end for a multi-liner. First class objects, functions, uh, and I'm gonna say that methods are the class methods and the instance methods and the functions are everything else, like code blocks and lambdas and procs. Um, the functions, um, well, the lambdas and the procs are already first class, uh, first class objects. Um, and they're instances of the proc class. Um, code blocks can be converted to first class objects by using the ampersand, they'll be converted to an instance of proc. Um, class and instance methods can be converted to first class objects uh, that are instances of the method class. Lambda and non-lambda procs. Um, I'm gonna say here procs and lambdas. Um, procs here is the same thing as a non-lambda proc, but the terminology is very confusing and unfortunate. Um, but both procs and lambdas are instances of the same proc class. They can be created uh, with this syntax. This is the uh, original conventional syntax for defining a lambda. But I like to use the, uh, the newer shorthand notation, which we sometimes call the stabby lambda with the arrow. Um, this is how we would create a proc. We could also do it this way, because for some reason, when you create a new instance of the proc class, it's a non-lambda. And we can query an instance of the proc class to see what kind of proc it is using this method. And in Ruby, you can use question marks and exclamation points in method names, not variable names, but method names. And uh, by convention, a question mark means that this method is a predicate method returning a true or false value. Um, the exclamation point would be used if the uh, if executing the method might be surprising or dangerous or something like that. Um, so we're asking each of these objects, are you a lambda? And we get a true and a false. As I said, it's really unfortunate, the terminology, because these two sound exactly the same when you're talking, but uh, they have different meanings. How would we uh, define lambs and procs to take arguments? Uh, well, if you use these forms, the code block style, then uh, the argument list would be delimited by the vertical bars. If you use the stabby lambda shorthand notation, then uh, the argument list is delimited by parentheses, which looks more like a function and I like that better. So that's what I'm usually using. Um, lambdas and procs and coblocks and methods, they all support a uh, return keyword, but they don't require it. And as you can see, there's no return keyword here. Um, the last evaluated value will be returned in, in the absence of a, an explicit return. And since there's only one evaluated value here, that's the last one and it will be returned. Um, if you need to return early, then of course you can use and you must use the return keyword in that case. Lambdas and procs differ in two important ways. Uh, one of them is arity checking, arity being the number of arguments in the, uh, in the signature in the parameter list. Oops. Um, lambdas have strict arity checking, but procs and coblocks do not. Here's an example of a lambda that takes two arguments and we call it with only one. We get an argument error. This is the common behavior of, of methods and functions, right? Um, but with a proc, that doesn't happen. We do the exact same thing with a proc, but when we call it with only one argument, we get this. Ruby just silently replaces any missing arguments with nil. The other way in which they differ is with the use of the return keyword. A lambda's return only returns from the lambda itself. 
but a proc or code blocks return returns from the enclosing method. Here are some examples. With the lambda, we can define a lambda here that just returns the string lambda. And then we call it. And then the final value, which will be used as a return value, uh, if there's no early return, um, is method. And we do, in fact, get this as the return val value because this return returned from the lambda, but not from the method. In contrast, if we do the same thing with a proc, it returns from the whole method. So we, we create the proc, we call it, and then we have this final string, but this line will never be reached because this return will return from the proc example one method. Now, if we remove the return keyword like this, then we'll get this first behavior where we will see the method return value. Ruby has a dot paren shorthand for call. And I use it a lot because it's, um, <clears throat> I use lambdas, I try to use lambdas a lot um, when they're appropriate, of course, and uh, it, it's handy for that. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a lambda that um, doubles a number. We can call it like this, but we can also call it like this. Um, this shorthand can be used for any object that has a call method, including class and instance methods. So it's not just specific to lambdas or procs. Um, it's basically a shorthand for the method whose name is call. Callables are anything containing a call method. Um, really, I, I like to think of them as interchangeable behaviors um, because Ruby has what's called duck typing. And that means uh, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. And the way that um, this relates to the Ruby language is um, if a, an object has a method of a given name, then that object can be, and, and method can be used anywhere another object with that name can be used. So there's no formal contract that's required to, to link them together or to, um, uh, to restrict or to permit um, substitution like that. And this turns out to be really handy in the cases where you want to have a method that takes a behavior and calls it. Um, the method doesn't need to know if it's a Lambda or a class or an instance, um, because all it needs to know is that it can call the call method on it. And so from the caller's point of view, that's super convenient because you can use whatever tool is the most appropriate for the use case. If it's a very simple behavior, a Lambda works fine but it could be a complex behavior requiring a, a large class of many methods. Um, and then the call method in that class would be the entry point into all of that behavior. Here's an example of, of uh, the, the, those four different things that can have a call method. We have a class method here, an instance method here, a Lambda and a proc. And we put them all together into an array and then we call the call method on each of them and we get this output here. Ruby has immutability, but kind of. Um, it's, um, it's not too great. Um, Ruby objects by default are mutable, but you can use the freeze method to freeze them. Here's an example of using the freeze method of arrays and strings. We create an array of two elements, and then we add an element to that array, and it works because the array is mutable by default. And then we ask the array, are you frozen? And it says no. And then we freeze it. And then we ask it again. And it says yes. And then when we try to add another object, we get a runtime error. But the elements of the array are still mutable. If we add a D to the first element, foo, we get food. And um, so what we need to do is we need to freeze each element. So then we can do it this way. And this is one of the things that I love about Ruby. You can do so much in such a simple and concise expression. Um, so on each of these, we can, uh, we can freeze uh, the object. And then when we try to add a string to one of the strings, uh, we get the error. And, and by the way, in the spirit of all the, the conveniences of Ruby, there's a first method on arrays and you can give it a parameter to get the first n elements, et cetera. But custom classes must define their own freeze methods. Can you trust them to do the right thing? 
And also objects created by dependent libraries will almost certainly not be immutable. So it's a work in progress. The hamster gem is a third party library that partly addresses this. Um, here's an example of a hamster vector. We initialize it with three values and then we add another value to it. And then in order to verify that they're different objects in memory, we can use this method. In Ruby, the equal question mark method is actually uh, object identity. It returns whether or not these are the same objects in memory. And they are. So I'm sorry, they're not. <laughs> they're not. Um, hamster created a new vector and the old one remains. And hamster also supports method chaining. We can convert a method to a first class object by using the method method. Here's a, an instance method of a class and uh, we can create an instance and then call method on the instance and pass it the name of the method as a symbol and it will return an instance of the class method, um, an instance. Um, and that instance can then be called. And that instance, by the way, or that, that, that method object will have the, um, it'll be bound to the, the object so that it'll have access to the state of the object from which it was retrieved. Ruby has a rich enumerable library that's fantastic. I really love it. Um, we saw the each, we saw the map already. We have select, reject, partition. And um, here we can you know, use this to see if they're even. Ruby also provides an even question mark method. And um, we can also use this shorthand for uh, a method on the object that will be tested. Um, we have select, reject, and partition, which returns two arrays, the matches and the non-matches, which I found to be really handy sometimes. We also have inject. A reminder, Keith, we only have three minutes left. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, inject, uh, all, any, none, compact, which removes nils, set operations, which are a really concise and logical way to, to deal with those kinds of operations, max, min, min, max, cycle, which cycles through uh, 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 these values. Um, tally is one of my favorites. It takes an array and returns a hash, a map of the uh, unique values as keys and the number of occurrences as values. Uh, we can shuffle an array, we can sample an array. Um, the Ruby enumerable collection methods do return a new instance most of the time. Uh, here's an example of a call to map. Um, and so we can ask this, this object, are you, equal, are you the same object in memory as this object? And it says no. So Ruby also is, is doing this. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the methods that mutate the object have names ending with the exclamation point so that you can be alerted that, you know, make sure you really want to do this. Uh, Ruby has lazy evaluation. We have an infinite range here. And when we call lazy on it, it becomes lazy and we can just take a finite number of them. And we have partial application and currying, and we have pattern matching, including type checking, guard clauses, and deconstruction. And here's uh, an example of how that might work. We have an input value and um, <clears throat> we have this match and this guard clause here, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, another one. And this will match if it's a task containing these keys, else this. <laughs> so that's it, folks. Thanks so much for joining. And uh, I'll go to the Hangout Room. And if anyone else would like to join me, that would be great. You're welcome to join me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Keith, for the session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.